Hello, I'm Nancy Dalva. I'm here at the Skirball Center with Rashawn Mitchell to discuss the Merce Cunningham Centennial Program here at this theater. Hi, Rashawn. Hi, Nancy. Tell me about the program. Ooh. Um, <clears throat> well, there's three choreographers, uh, Mina Nishimura, Neta Yerushalmi, and Mariah Evans, <coughs> excuse me, who are all creating new works in response to Merce Cunningham. Um, and the proposal is really open. And I don't know exactly what they're doing. They're all deeply entrenched in their processes right now. And I'm getting glimpses of things that they're doing. Um, but it will be a shared bill. And there will also be two uh, performers uh, performing Cunningham choreography, Shayla B. Jenkins and Keith Sabado. Um, and Davison Scandrett is doing the lighting for the entire thing. Um, and it is just an experiment in seeing kind of how Merce's legacy and Merce's influence resides in these particular women, but also as a proxy for kind of the larger contemporary landscape. So, And what are you doing? <clears throat> I'm doing this. <laughs> I'm talking to you. I mean, I essentially am acting as curator, um, guest curator, I suppose. Um, I... I am a trustee of on the Cunningham Trust, and so one of the sort of mandates of the trust is to kind of preserve and enhance Merce's work. Um, and of course, we are in the centennial year, so he would have been 100 now. Um, and there are lots of different um, programs happening um, throughout the world um, this entire year um, of different scales and types. Um, and when I became a trustee, I think I just, you know, I was trying to think about how, what I could bring to the table that wasn't already there, maybe. And um, it was clear to me that the centennial would certainly consist of a lot of very typical things that we would expect, you know, the repertory being performed, right? There's lots of companies that are performing the work. There's lots of freelance dancers that are performing the work. There's this huge, you know, Night of 100 solos that's happening. This is happening in three <coughs> theaters the same day, Merce's 100th birthday, in London, in Brooklyn, and in Los Angeles. And performers almost all previously unacquainted with Cunningham's work are performing solos that are being put into an event so that many solos will happen at the same time. And it's all being live streamed, so if you're really dedicated, you could see the whole thing. And it's just so ambitious, right? This project, uh, Night of a Hundred Solos, um, and it's very exciting. And and two of your dancers <coughs> on this program are performing parts of that program. That's right. Um, Corey Kresge and Eleanor Houlihan are both in Night of a Hundred Solos, and they both have danced in my work. And are they in this program? They're not in this program. But Keith Sabado is in the Night but of a Hundred Solos. But Keith Sabado... Oh, that's what you mean. Yeah, Keith Sabado and Shayla V. Jenkins are both performing in Night of a Hundred Solos at BAM and have agreed to also perform their solos at Skirball. And one of the one of the beautiful things about the Night of a Hundred Solos is that all of the dancers that have um, agreed to do the project have been given a license to perform their solos that they've learned for the next two years. So <clears throat> it's a nice way to think about the future um, and to give them opportunities to perform the work. Did you stage any of these solos? I did. Um, I taught eight different solos, um, four of them in New York and four of them in London, which I just got back from London. Um, and Daniel Squire is directing the, the London event and Patricia Lent is directing the New York event. All um, of these people are former Cunningham dancers who now stage Mercy's work. That's right, that's right. Um, and I just, you know, I went to London and taught these solos in an environment that was really remarkable actually um, we were they were the rehearsal process was happening at the Wayne McGregor studios it's a beautiful open sort of white space and um, all of the dancers that were enlisted to do this are from different companies the Rambert company Scottish Ballet different freelance dancers um, and so it was a real nice mix of people and artists and bodies and, and interests and backgrounds and 
um, everyone kind of exchanging at the same time. Um, and everyone working simultaneously in the same room, which was really fascinating. It does sound as if there's a baseline technical facility in that group. Oh, yeah. I mean, I didn't have anything to do with the casting of any of these. Uh, well, that's not true. I did recommend some people. But um, certainly, in order to do Merce's work successfully, there's a certain technical level of proficiency that one needs or is ideal. Um, and all of these dancers have that, right? Um, so that's sort of the baseline, but then getting them to that place in a very short amount of time where the work actually looks like the work, that's a different challenge. Had you <laughs> danced all the things you coached? I had danced all the things I coached, yes. Um, a lot of the solos that I taught were, were Merce's roles, actually. So I taught a, a little bit from Crises, um, I taught a solo from Square Game, I taught um, two different solos from Antic Meat, um, something from Split Sides, my solo from Nearly 90. I think there's a couple of other ones in there. I taught a Changing Step solo, actually, to Danny McCusker, which was really quite fun to do. Um, I didn't perform that solo very much, but it was one of those solos that was like a training um, training material for, for new dancers coming into the company. So in some cases, you're passing on a material that you acquired directly from Merce, and you are now transferring it or transmitting it to a next generation or across generations. Yeah. Since some of these dancers are, after all, your own age. Yeah. Uh, do you feel there's a special responsibility in any way when the role was Merce's? Ooh, I mean, I think there's a special responsibility, period. Um, that's a good answer. It, no, really, because, you know, it's certainly um, relatively easy to teach a step, right? You know, you can break it down to the, the building block of the material itself. And a lot of people are skilled at learning a step and a series of steps. But there's this other kind of underlying information or mysterious kind of um, aspect of the work that has to be transmitted to, and that's a lot harder. Well, Sean Mitchell, you have now gotten to the questions that I wrote <laughs> down to ask you without my asking them, which is what makes up Cunningham besides steps? Oh my God, it's so, such a fascinating question, isn't it? I would like you to talk <clears throat> about intention, yeah. phrasing, yeah. and that within any given phrase, or what Merce would say, how to get from here to there. There are choices for you, mm -hmm. and that that might even change from performance to performance. Right, right, right. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. So what do you, when you coach, once the steps are there, how do you convey the rest? Well, it's tricky, it's complicated, it's... Um, imperfect and I think I have a lot of anxiety about it actually when I'm in the moment because there's a part of me that wants to remain as neutral as possible and to just deliver the information that I was given but you were given that information in the Cunningham studio by Cunningham so yes. there's all this or by the anointed yes. teachers stagers. Of, and stagers of the work that I learned, um, yes. We can say that Merce knew how to draw out the qualities that he wanted, and he knew what he wanted, yeah. and if you look in the notes you can see it. Yeah. Might have been a pretty complex thing he wanted. Yeah. He could get that just by giving stage directions. Right. Because he was who he was. Exactly. And all of, for me, the way that he spoke to me and the way that he coached me and directed me the language that he used was always pretty anatomical or sort of energetic, maybe. Um, never, you know, narrative or metaphorical or image-based, just super matter-of-fact, right? Um, and yet, I think as a dancer in the work, you arrive through the repetition of, of so much repetition, but through the repetition of the work, you arrive at some other kind of meaning, I think, in yourself that does get, that is palpable, right? And so how do you transmit that? I think that's a really interesting question. 
And then there's another thing which is more technical, perhaps, which are elements of stagecraft which don't have to do with steps, but at which I consider you to be the supreme exponent. For example, how to get the audience to look where you want them to look. Are they looking at your foot? Are they looking into the wings? How do you direct where they're looking? And when do you look at them? And when I look at your videos, yeah. I can see that this is part of how you dance. Well, I think maybe it would be good to tell a story. I When I first got into the company, um, there was a very, very, very short period of transmission time between Ashley Chen, who I replaced, and myself. And he taught me all of his repertory in a very short amount of time. And the, the situation is so pressured um, and precious. And I remember often being learning something um, and not quite knowing it yet and being thrust in front of Merce to show the material. And there was something, re I, I, it's so, um, st such a strong memory in my mind because of the, the, the sort of pressure of the situation. Um, and I remember thinking like, okay, you know, you don't know what you're doing at all. <laughs> so how do you manage that? How do you negotiate that? Um, and there was a certain str sort of survival strategy that I developed in the beginning to, to somehow convey that I knew what I was doing without actually knowing. And somehow it was legible or passable until I was able to actually fully integrate all of the movement because it is very complex movement to coordinate, generally speaking. Um, and I feel like there was something about intentionality. There's something about maybe the tone in the body. There's um, See what you're doing now. There's an energy, this, this, a the, sensibility that is developed through the training system and through being in front of Merce. When you go like this, that's one of the qualities, which is that even when still, mm -hmm. you are moving. Yeah. The current of energy across yeah. the body never stops. Yeah. Stillness is just another kind of moving. Right. Yes, and so for me, I feel like I didn't necessarily think about this when I was dancing the work, but now that I've moved past that and I am doing a lot of reflecting and looking at the archives and digging into these questions of legacy and like what remains and, and what, what the question is like really for me, what is the work? Because I feel that the most obvious answer is the, the repertory, it's the step. But for me, there's that's a little hollow feels like um, a fossil or like an art object of some kind versus this mysterious kind of underlying information that is present in the performer and and also the larger idea of the work you know uh, Merce's philosophies uh, his his methodologies his process okay. I was trying to talk about what the work what I what I'm trying to get at about what the work is is because without the life force of the artist, without the sort of apparatus of the whole system that has created the environment, the collaborators, the, the sort of like ethical concerns, the methodologies, like all of that for me is the work. And it builds into the thing that gets seen as the product. But yeah, so the performance is the tip of an iceberg. Totally. Yes. Yeah. There's the studio at West Beth. Yeah. There's all the dancers who've come before. Yeah. Who move in and out. Yeah. To see you. Yeah. And there's his notation system that we now have more access to. Um, you know, a lot of his notes and the way that he worked were not available to us um, when he was alive. And now that he's passed, you know, people are digging into the notes and looking at each piece and sort of starting to, um, to, uh, kind of open up or understand what was at play, what questions he had in each piece, you know, and how, you know, for instance, how did he use the chance procedures? You know, I think it's a really huge misconception that people have, right? Let's address this conception that yeah. people think that you were making that up in the wings. Yeah, no, they think, people say that often, like, you're, oh, you were improvising, or you kind of just did whatever you wanted, or Merce just rolled the dice to, like, make all the decisions. It's like, no, that's not at so all. So let's return to something earlier. Yeah. 
that you said, which was that the people doing this now are entrenched in process. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think there's this notion that somehow Merce was a very processy person in uh -huh. the studio. Right. But he did all of that before yeah. he came he in. He did that by himself. He used chance at some point or points in the making of every work. But once he decided, it was done. It was done. Yeah. With rare exception. Yeah. And by the time it got to us, it was already a relatively fixed thing. And of course, there's interpretation, um, and there's the there's things that get lost or, or gained in transmission, but pretty much the, the step that was delivered to us was usually transmitted verbally uh, by in the time, era. in my era, by the time I was there, yeah, because he wasn't really able to move um, his body in the same way. Um, so there was a real clarity always. Your generation was able to make his thoughts visible. It went from his words into your performing. It, it was an extraordinary mm. ability mm. that you all developed, I think. Well, I think by the time, you know, in my generation, he was a different verse than I think he was prior. And I think we all sort of had a, a more sort of loving, grandfatherly relationship to him. So yes. I don't know if that engendered something in the work, but... That's an interesting point. Earlier dancers have noted with some asperity that yeah. you got a different I think we verse. got a better deal, maybe, <laughs> on well, some levels. I, I was very pleased to hear you say Merce would have been 100, mm -hmm. because the idea that he is 100 seems strange to me, mm -hmm. because he isn't. To me, mm -hmm. he's, as we last knew him, at 90, but he's also all the ages he ever was that you now can consider him. Yeah, he's exponential. Is the continuum of his entire life, yeah. but also we now can stand back and see the repertory as a whole. Mm -hmm. So standing here now in this place that you're in, where you're a choreographer yourself, you have your own work, your mm -hmm. own company, you're doing all these things with the trust, mm -hmm. What is your survival strategy for keeping Merce in your mind as he was? I don't try to do that. What do you do? <laughs> or do you just don't think about it? Mm, I mean, I do think about it. I think I've had different strategies over at different points in time, um, and a lot of them have to do with my own physiology and what's going on in my body and how my body is responding to motion. Um, some of it has to do with the, the choreographic questions that I find myself asking in my own work and always there's there's the understanding that like I am inevitably and uh, forever linked to him and so on some level whatever I do or make is can is often seen through the lens of him and um, so I think on, in certain pieces that I've made I've tried to address that in certain pieces I've made I've tried to ignore that I've tried to go really far away I've tried to go back to the scene of the crime and kind of uncover things and rearrange things um, and I, I, I guess that that means that I'm interested in this idea of legacy idea of influence and this idea of like passing things on and, and how we evolve um, as a society as a culture as individuals um, and I think I those questions are always present and I think I I'm in this place now where I'm like transferring those questions over to other people to see how they handle it and to see if they might illuminate something to me that I haven't been able to discover yet um, and so I think all of these choreographers are not the most obvious choice, right? It's like, in terms of thinking about who's influenced by Merce Cunningham, I mean, you could say Pam Tanowitz, or you could say Sarah Mitchelson, or you could say a lot of other people. Liz Gehring. Liz Gehring. Um, or uh, even, even choreographers who are of a much older generation, like Trisha Brown. Exactly. Yeah, and of course, all of the people that danced for him that are choreographers, you of know, Kimberly Bartosik and Jonah Bocaire, like different people, Neil Greenberg. I mean, there's lots of people that could have been asked to do this, but Douglas I feel like Dunn. Douglas Dunn, exactly. But I feel like I wanted to choose and think about people that weren't the most obvious choice and to see if we could uncover slightly more like invisible threads. Well, there's a. I want to think 
about two things that I thought about your work after MERS. The first one was, I went to Boston to see your staging of how to pass Ask kickball, kickball and run at yeah. the ICA, and I realized what an amazing stager you were of the work. Well, and, and that was the first staging it was so good. project I ever did. And then I went to see your own work, mm -hmm. and I was just, it was such a revelation to mm -hmm. me, because I'd seen you dancing Merce's roles, and I had just thought you were like that. Right, right, right. And when I saw you as yourself in your own work, I thought, oh my goodness, he's just entirely different. Yeah. That was truly performance. It was yeah. a yeah. sublime, not an impersonation, but an embodiment yeah. of someone else's qualities. And yeah. I hadn't realized how, what an advanced activity and acting that was until I saw you as yourself. Yeah, well, it's interesting because when I used to do, when I was, you know, you take class every day, right, as a dancer and certainly in, in that work, and you, the technique is a thing that you know, it's a formula, you know, and you repeat the same exercises every day with slight variations, right? And I just remember, like, always feeling like I would start the class not knowing exactly who I was or what I felt, and, um, just going through some kind of emotions but like somehow in the process like arriving at myself like oh. it's almost like identity forming to do the class in a weird way so like there was a sort of stretch of embodiment that happened every day over and over again right but that yes. accumulates over time and I feel like some of the work like the more abs, I don't know when to use that word, but some of the more complex later works are much considered to be more abstract than some of the earlier works. They're less narrative. Less They're, narrative. The subliminal yeah. narrative is even more severe. But to do crises, for instance, required me to be an actor. Like, yes. That's the thing. Yes. So, and it wasn't explicitly relayed to me in that way. It's just that as I was learning it and as we were all like collaboratively trying to arrive at the thing that we thought it could be, um, I felt like, oh, I have to actually tap into something that is completely outside of this technique, actually, and completely outside of everything that I've learned about this work. It's like I'm drawing from some other place. And I think we all do that as dancers and as performers. We're always drawing from different places, um, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. But I think it's like that that's the stickiness there, mm. I think, that is the work almost and when dealing with transmission when dealing with like having to teach these roles to different people who never met him or didn't see the work or and don't have the trained, technique yes um it's i do have to almost kind of relay my own experiential knowledge in a different way you can't you one of the things that cunningham's dancers got to do over time was move backwards in time like wizards and dance through the repertory. Yeah. And yeah. always the dancers moving backwards found the dancers, and always the dancers who moved backwards found yeah. the work easier than the dancers who'd come into it originally because the technique got so much more complex. Oh, I, could, I actually disagree. You it's disagree, slightly, Great. I slightly disagree Tell me. because I feel like, or I think I disagree if I understand what you said correctly. Um, you know, I feel like in my generation, we got really good at moving very fast. Super And fast. doing lots of complicated, isolated movements and really intricate rhythms. Like, that was our thing, you know? And when we were asked to go back to the 60s and do these sort of, like, more austere, kind of, like, more full-bodied, you know, actions, we, we were we weren't very good at it. It was, that is it really was like, super putting on a different outfit you know and trying it's not quite fitting right so that's how I felt about it actually I asked Merce about it I said is it important that the dancers have danced through the repertory yeah. and he said oh yes mm -hmm. uh, I want to mention another piece of yours interface yeah. where to my interpretive mind mm -hmm. you asked yourself what didn't Merce choreograph for and the answer was the face yeah so you extended the act of choreography to the face. Yeah. And I thought that was a radical extension of what you were already doing. Mm. And so that fits in with your part of your description of what you do now. I think yeah. it might be important, as long as we're here on camera, to say what it is you do here at NYU. 
Oh, yeah. Well, I teach in the dance department at Tisch School of the Arts, um, where I'm also the associate chair. And I've been there for um, seven years. And I've had a trajectory of teaching that has really shifted over time. Um, first coming in really as a Cunningham teacher. And that was what I was hired to do. Um, but then immediately sensing some friction about teaching a technique, a like archaic technique to a younger generation of people who've never, who have no access to the work. And so being confronted with this question of how to make it relevant and whether it should even be relevant, I don't know, there's a lot of questions that I have there, but just how to create access points to the work has been something of interest for me and I've done a lot of work in trying to expand the technique to kind of like unpack it to kind of like infuse it with other newer ideas um, and other kind of stylistic interests. It's um, a fusion now. It's a fusion and I think that Merce would have actually liked that. I don't well, think that that on. I don't think that that is I think that Merce was a fluid person and I think yes. that Merce was someone who was always changing and progressing and growing and I think that he would have wanted his technique to continue to grow as well. I don't think it was an, a, a solidified object, but you know, you can argue with me there, I'm I sure. I would argue with the <laughs> two points. I would say that the technique is not archaic. It may be archaic in the context in which you teach because this is That's what I mean, very yeah. it's not archaic to postmodern yeah. and forward looking dance department. Yeah. But in the Cunningham workshops and in the classes that are held, we see that learning this archaic technique, as mm -hmm. you put it, mm -hmm. makes anyone a better dancer to do anything. Yeah, totally. So it's a, it's a toolkit, the technique. Yeah, and all of this, the choreographers that are on this program have trained in Cunningham in different ways. I mean, Mina, Mina and I met when I was an understudy at the studio, and she was a, you know, an international student there. And so I've known her for 20 years, and she trained in that technique for many years. And you would never really know it because you, we think of her as this like Futo artist and as this postmodern dancer. But I think that there's like you can sense it in her sense of time, in her imagination. Um, she's got a wild imagination. I mean, you can feel it in these other ways that are not so obvious in terms of like line, shape. With Netta, I don't feel it when I see her dance in her own work, but when you see her in Pantano, it's, yeah. you see the Cunningham totally. in there. And she's got this like bold, kind of ambitious, really kind of in-your-face sensibility that I think also has some crossover with Merce. And then Mariah, you know, has also, you know, been a dancer for a long time and has taken classes at the studio and has taken workshops, and so she's you know, she also has access points as well, but I think her work is, um, for me, there, the overlap there is, is more of a conceptual thing and, and a really like sort of rigorous mental exercise. And she creates these really elaborate notation systems and there's a certain like driving pulse in her work that I think um, I relate to Merce as well. So I think all three of these choreographers, you know, you'll see the influences in, in very different ways, which I hope at least. I'm thinking of you saying what Merce would have liked or not liked, and I think that you're in a place where you can state that because you had a long well, relationship I mean, I with I am, him. but I also got that, I have to be fair and say that, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with other dancers in the work and it, it, throughout the company. And so I'm not, this is, these aren't necessarily just my words. Like I have spoken to Jeannie Steele, who, as you know, was a dancer for a long time and super close to him. And she has told me that he said that he understood that people might be able to improve on his original ideas in terms of the technique itself. So I find that to be like super galvanizing. Yes. One of the things. I would say from my own point of view that when people say Merce would have loved this, I say, and they say, don't you think? And I say, well, I can't say what Merce would think right. or say or do in right. the present. I, mean, I think you might be able to say that, but I can't. But what I can tell you is what Merce did say yeah. and did and you do. Know that. And just as important, Rajan, yeah. what Merce didn't say right. 
and didn't do. Right. What he didn't do is an enormously important oh, yeah. thing that I only realized when he's gone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when he was in the room, there were things people didn't do. There yeah. were liberties people wouldn't take. Yeah. But I do know that one thing he said, and he said it to Robert Swinston, his very long time assistant, do something else. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's and a keep going, keep going, keep going, and keep do going. something else. And this is exactly yeah. what so you're doing. So this is doing. something else. This is something yes. else. So for Mercy's so birthday, we do something exactly. else. Exactly. And yeah, you can go see companies perform their repertory mm -hmm. and do it so beautifully. And then you could engage with the work on different levels too, I think is what is important for me to convey to people is that it's not just one monolithic thing. There's actually all of these layers and different contexts for engaging in his, his work, so. I went to Lyon to see Exchange. Uh -huh. A beautiful work of Mercer's, which I hadn't seen for a very long time and which I'd never seen him in, although there's a beautiful film of that with him in it. And he keeps striking the warrior pose. Mm. Was Mercer a warrior? Well, I would that's one of those questions that I would throw back at you that you would hate, but like, is <laughs> he ahead. a warrior? I just such it's, a it seems like you think of him that way. I I <laughs> I don't necessarily think of him that way, but he certainly was someone that, you know, could persevere. That's what I was going to say. He was so, so persevering. Yeah. So intense. So he's a beautiful example of just like keeping going. Yes. And like the accumulation of knowledge over time. I mean, I think that that's beautiful. If he so. was a warrior, I think what he was battling were the restrictions of age. Right. And making his world larger, not smaller. Yeah. And the reason he could do that was because you all were in the room. And now we're not. And now, <laughs> yes. Well, well we on that sentimental now, note, um, I will add but. that I am the scholar in residence of the Merce Cunningham Trust, and I invite you to look at the Trust's wonderful YouTube channel. This summer we're releasing 10 videos that have been saved for Merce's centennial, and one of them is a full-length performance of Square Game, mm -hmm. filmed at Ann Arbor, Michigan, with Rashawn Mitchell in Mercer's role, and it is and spectacular. Dress, so. You're wearing some pants. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Admit that there are pants. There are pants. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure to have a chance to visit yeah. with you here at the Skirball. I know that this will inform people who are coming to the show before and also after. after. And we also invite you to follow us on show social media. Yeah. And thank you very much. Thanks, Nancy. Always a pleasure. Uh -huh.